Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Sisma Audio. I'm very glad tonight to open this series of uh, Hong Kong, as we would say in French, and I'm French speaking rather than English, uh, for many reasons. The main one, since my wife is not in the audience, is that I can confess, but you can witness, I love food. <laughs> of course, I see the eyes of some specialists in the, in the audience that are looking to me in a very uneasy way, but this is a personal story. I love food, and I think that everybody loves food in this part of the world, because uh, food in this part of the world, and my my job has brought me to other parts of the world also, is uh, more than just a way to uh, enjoy yourself or just feed yourself. It's uh, uh, a whole scenery. And it produces many things. It produces ideas, it produces friendships, it may even produce love. So, we in the Mediterranean, we understand food in a different way than people in cold northern parts of the planet do. So I'm very happy that we are going to discuss food in different aspects, not only historical, but also from a today's perspective, since um, I think that we have been using food and enjoying it in the same way. So tonight we will start with bread. Um, we we'll go to more serious things later on with uh, alcohol. Important. For everything. It kills everything. I'll give you a recipe when the time comes. And if I'm here on the last day of this uh, speeches on, in May, which is I hope not very probable. Um, I will cook for you fasolada, which is fasulia Turkish, but in a different way. It's a soup in Greece. And I will cook it because I know how to do it. I will cook it personally. And for another reason, uh, you have to know that when you cook this soup in big quantities, it becomes better than when you cook it in small quantities. So imagine. A solada for 200 people. Fantastic. It will remind me my days in the art. So, welcome and enjoy yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sismanobio Megaro. My name is Bailey from the Sismanobio Megaro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our lectures in Sismanovio Megaro. This year's circle of lectures at the Sismanovio Megaro is dedicated to the history of food, one of the aspects of everyday life which has for many years been an independent historiographical field. It was chosen as the theme of this year's lectures because a central part of the history of food is taken up by the analytical categories of sociability, mutuality, nutritional cooking and dietary patterns, tastes, religious fasting, dietary prohibitions and taboos, nutrition and diet as an aspect of ethnic, national, local and social differentiation. Diet, a long-term phenomenon, permeates countries, religions, classes, nations, cultures, memories. It is a theme that has to do with identity and alternity, 
and is therefore potentially very interesting to explore among the populations that live and are still alive that created and continue to create culture at more, at, amidst various political formations in the geographical area of the Eastern Mediterranean. There are until very recently the following saying held true, Istem Achmas, Istem Achta. My name is made northern by increasing the earnings, but by limiting the consumption of food. I remember always this phrase uh, yeah, when I was a child. When my father came uh, with a quantity of meat more than a kilo, my grandma mother used to say, Istenat mas, Istenat, and then that. This was uh, the uh, uh, ideology of the Anatolian population of this area. The history of food was chosen as it records essential aspects of economic and social life. These are associated primarily with the climate, production, types of economy, demographic and political elements, with setting prices, regulating the availability of foodstuffs, lay, laying down rules that determine dietary and medical perceptions and over time shaping eating habits. This was of course affected by convergences and divergences imposed by religions as well as by Western style customs a la Franca that were adopted in the 19th century by local urban societies, namely evening parties, dinners with dancing and music, tail coats and crinolines. Colleagues from different countries, from different disciplines, will speak about timelessness and also about specific periods in the history and culture of bread, oil, wine, the foundations of the Mediterranean diet. Others will refer to the position held by food, cooking and consumption in the collective conscience of a group or society. I would like to express my sincere thanks to all my colleagues for their willingness to participate in this series of lectures organized by the National Hellenic Research Foundation in collaboration with Sismanoglion Megaro. The subject matter will obviously not fit into eight circles as planned. We look forward to future collaboration with all of those interested. The times we live in make this essential. We begin our series of lectures with bread. It is for this we toil each day. It is no coincidence that in Greece we have an expression that says, Vgazo to psomimu. In other words, I earn my daily bread, the minimum I need to live on. Today, ladies and gentlemen, in this economic crisis, sufficiency of this minimum amount makes people sufficient, uh, satisfied, and the lack of it brings misery and despair. I would like 
now to call April, my young and esteemed colleague, Gerasimos Merganos, a promising Byzantinist, participating in the program Daily Life in Byzantium to take the floor. He will talk about bakeries in Byzantine Constantinople. And this will be followed by my old friend, Mariana Gerasimou, who will speak metaphorically and literally about the 40 types of bread in the Ottoman Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our lectures. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is both a great honor and a pleasure to be here in the Queen of Cities, as the Byzantines used to call it. Uh, therefore, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Evangelia Balta for her kind invitation to participate in this uh, series of lectures. And I would also like to thank the Consulate General of Greece in Istanbul for uh, the warm uh, hospitality and the impeccable organization. Bread made of various kinds of cereals was the basis of daily diet in Byzantium, excelling all other foodstuffs. The word bread signified nourishment par excellence in the Middle Ages, and Byzantine notions did not differ in this respect. Moreover, the religious and theological connotations conveyed by the verse of the most famous Christian prayer, the Pater Noster, in Greek, ton arton imon ton epiusion dosimin simeron, give us this day our daily bread, pervaded the notion of bread in Byzantine society. Bread was the simplest foodstuff required for a person to survive and simultaneously the most revered, along with oil and wine. It is worth mentioning that bread is often present in Byzantine literature and its significance as a multifaceted notion has survived in modern Greek language and culture. For example, the well-known in modern Greek proverb, opios pinatho ripso mia ki opios dipsa pigadia, whoever is hungry sees loaves of bread and whoever is thirsty wells, which denotes the longing for what someone lacks is already to be found in the 12th century romans Ismini and Ismenias by F. Matthios Macremvolitis in the following form, quote, a starving man's mind imagines bread and water fills the thirsty man's dreams, end quote. The importance of bread here as the main object of desire of a starving man is enhanced by its coupling with the, with the uniqueness of water, the only liquid which quenches thirst and sustains life. Let me give you one more example of the presence of bread in Byzantine literature before discussing our main subject. In a unique concerning its theme, ekphrasis, that is a rhetorical description, the 11th century poet Christopher of Mytilene describes a special loaf. To use Paul Magdalino's words, it was sculpted with representations of the 12 signs of the zodiac and studied with 18 eggs from different birds and of different sizes, symbolizing the Pleiades, the seven planets known to the ancient and medieval world, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the Star of Orion, and the four cardinal points. Such a loaf is reminiscent of the Tsureki, a sweet bread decorated with eggs, or of the Labropsomo, Easter's bread, which both are still baked in modern Greece to celebrate Easter. The equally interesting thing in Christopher Mytilini's poem is that the God's making of the firmament is depicted in terms of working the Tao. Quote, from modest but smooth Tao stretched out the heavens for us, end quote. 
The aforementioned indicative examples illustrate the importance of bread in Greek culture diachronically. Now it is time to pass to our main theme. The Greek words which the Byzantines used to denote bread were artos, psomion, or psomin, and psomos. The main kinds of Byzantine bread, at least those named in Byzantine sources, reflected social inequality, among other things. For instance, some verses in the 12th century Ptochoprodromic poems, written in the vernacular, contrast between the bread acquired by rich and poor, respectively. Quote, they eat baguettes, we get bread from bran. They eat the white bread, warm from the oven and sprinkled, and sprinkled with sesame, we get it from the coarse ground flour, coated with ashes, end quote. Elsewhere, Tohoprodromos discerns between the psomin called afratitsin, that is foamy bread, which was of high quality, and the mesocatharon, which is described as the bread of, of poverty. Eustathius, Archbishop of Thessaloniki, a contemporary of Tohoprodromos, also refers in his treatise on the improvement of monasticism to foamy and porous bread, which was exceedingly white. It is known from various sources that the top quality bread was called artos katharos, pure bread, which the classicizing Eustathius of Thessaloniki characterizes as akrefnis, unmixed pure, in his account of the capture of Thessaloniki by the Normans of Sicily. This was white bread made of wheat flour. The Cathari arti were of two qualities. The finest was the silignitis, from the Latin silignineus panis, made of the finest flour, usually being zifted out in a very thin silk sieve. These breads were also called silk breads. The next high quality bread was the semidalitis, also made of wheat flour, but which was less finely sieved. A medium quality bread called mesos or mesocatharos artos, half purity bread, was made of wheat flour mixed with other flours. The lower bread quality was the riparos artos, dirty bread, made of bran or barley. This low quality bread is depicted in Byzantine literature to be either the bread of poverty or the bread of captivity. Eustathius of Thessaloniki portrays himself and some Thessalonians eating bread made with bran, pitirias, after the capture of the city by the Normans. The generalizing distinction between Cathari, pure, and ripari, dirty breads, is also made by Simeon Sith in his book on diet. It should be noted that bread was not consumed always fresh, but in some cases in dry form. The biscuit, or rusk, in Greek paximadion, or dipyros artos, literally twice-baked bread, was invaluable for the sustenance of sailors and soldiers, while it was essential for fasting monks too. From artos derived the majority of names of professions concerning the milling of grain and the making and selling of bread, simply speaking of the baker as well as names denoting bakeries. For example, the terms artokopos, baker, artopios, bread maker, or baker, and artopolis, baker, once again, generally denote the baker, whereas terms such as artokopion, bakehouse, and artopolion, baker shop, define bakeries. It should be noted that the word mangips from the Latin mancaps, which employed to denote the baker as well, whose shop in this case was called mangipion. Terminology itself, along with testimonies from Byzantine sources, <coughs> leads to question the assumption that the various terms naming professionals of bread signify a single profession. In other words, it is not clear whether every term concerning bakers denotes a professional who both made and sold in retail bread. For example, the late 20th century pseudo lexicon distinguishes between 
and artopolion, or magipion, in which bread is made, it is the bakery, and an artopolion, in which bread is sold, it is a bread shop. An earlier source, Theophanes the Confessor, narrates an episode during the reign of Justinian I, which seems to agree with this distinction between bread shops and bakeries. According to Theophanes, a rumor spread through the capital that the emperor had died. Quote, so the people suddenly seized the bread from the bread shops and bakeries, and at about the third hour, no bread could be found in the whole city, end quote. In contrast, the 10th century, the Cerimoni Saule Byzantine, describes how Joseph Brinkas opposed to the proclamation of Nikiforos <coughs> II Focas as emperor, and among other measures Brinkas took, quote, mounting a horse and going through the million, he gave orders to the bakers not to make bread or to put it out for sale in the market, end quote. Therefore, according to the source, the Artopii both baked and sold bread, at least in the certain location of Constantinople. From a first glance, terminology sometimes appears to be contradictory, but the attempt to disambiguate the various terms concerning the profession of the baker should be case sensitive. Depending on place, time, and conditions, two different terms could either be referring to subcategories of the professional branch of bakers or simply be synonyms, possibly describing a different feature of the same occupation. In small towns particularly, the professional who milled the grain, baked the bread and sold it must have been the one and same person and this most probably applied also to Constantinopolitan areas outside the main bread bar market of the capital. The latter remark is reinforced by stipulation of the ninth century collection of laws entitled the Basilica, which shows that it was customary for bakers to send their slaves to sell bread made by themselves in neighborhoods. It is noteworthy that in the 14th century Candia in Crete, then under Venetian rule, a similar distinction applied between bread makers, fornari or pancogoli, and bread sellers, panettieri where pistores were both bakers and sellers of bread. However, these branches were usually considered identical. On the other hand, terminology concerning bakeries requires further attention, not only due to testimonies such as these of Theophanes and the Suda. Regarding small cities, once again, it is likely that the place where bread was made and the place where bread was sold must have been identical. However, the capital housed a huge population whose number could have reached 400,000 in 1204 with vast everyday needs in bread. In Constantinople, almost everybody had to buy bread from the baker, even the large aristocratic houses, since it was rather difficult to mill grain and bake bread in the city due to hygiene and security prohibitions. Only large monastic communities did not have to resort to the baker. Therefore, it does not seem improbable to assume that along with bakeries where bread was baked and sold on location, bread workshops could have possibly supplied daily bread shops, street vendors, as well as charitable institutions which distributed bread to the poor. Moreover, it is possible that some of these workshops would have been involved in the supply of the army. The main baker's market in the capital was the Artopolia, near the port of Julian and the granary of Lamia, the sole remaining granary after the early, after the early Byzantine period, formerly known as the Horeum Alexandrinum. Of course, as already noted, this could not have been the only bakeries of a large city. The fifth century Notitia Urbis Constantinopolitane gives a total of 140 bakeries in Constantinople, of which 120 were private and 20 were public, scattered in every region of the city. Although many things would have been altered in the capital since the fifth century, 
The notitious information concerning the diffusion of bakeries all over Constantinople shows a situation which must have been similar in Middle Byzantium as well. Moreover, the aforementioned private bakeries are most probably related with subsequent bakers of the Middle Byzantine period. As happens in most other cases with regard to professions, the most detailed information concerning professional bakers comes from Constantinople. The 10th century Book of the Eparch, in particular, a collection of regulations of the activity of 22 Constantinopolitan guilds is invaluable as a source. The Eparch was in modern terms the mayor of Constantinople and he had an responsibility for trade and commerce in its area. The Book of the Eparch reserves its 18th chapter for the Guild of Bakers. It is entitled Peritonartopion Iti Mangipon, thus using both widely used terms to describe the relevant professionals. The chapter on bakers deals in general with profit, requisitions, safety regulations, and the weight of bread, aspects which were paramount for the guild's uninterrupted function. I will not examine the stipulations of the chapter in the sequence they appear, but rather thematically. The Book of the Eparch reveals the importance of this guild and its irreplaceable role in the alimentation of Constantinople by exempting its members from all requisitions to a public authority. Neither they nor the animals they used to mill the grain were liable to corvées. That is public service, so that to devote the themselves to the production of bread without any hindrance. That was a notable difference be between bakers and other guilds, the latter being subject to corvées of various forms, labor, cash, provision of animals, etc., in a variety of cases. Concerning safety regulations, the Book of the Eparch prohibits a, baker, a bakery to be built under dwellings or near them, but only in safe locations, Due to, the due to the flammable materials used in ovens. This stipulation was significant for the, for the safety of a capital notoriously exposed to fire hazard. Moreover, as the chapter on bakers from the sixth century treatise on urban planning under the name of Julian of Ascalon shows, relevant regulations aimed also at protecting neighboring dwellings from being smoked by the bakery's ovens. Other paragraphs of the Book of the Eparch show the close supervision that the Eparch and his staff exerted on the Guild of Bakers, which produced such an important foodstuff. Paragraph 18.1 implies that the bakers went regularly to the prefecture when it states that, quote, the bakers must, on the order of the eparch, make their weights conform with the purchase price of the wheat. Having purchased a quantity of wheat corresponding to one nomisma, that is, a gold coin, and having milled it and let it rise in the presence of the eparch's assessor, they must calculate their profit." End quote. This profit was regulated to one keration plus two milarisia per gold coin, gross profit, from which the keration, one twenty-fourth per gold coin, or 4.16%, was the net profit, while the two milarisia, one-sixth per gold coin, or 16.66%, were used to pay operating expenses, such as the sustenance of the baker's people and animal which was employed in grinding the grain. Also, for rent, heating of the oven, and torches, idest lighting. The fixed profit of the baker was related with just profit, a concept highly esteemed by the church and the state of the Middle Byzantine period, which was interconnected with the notions of just value and just price. Just profit, was what was considered to be legitimate profit for the, for the acquiring of which a merchant would not have taken advantage of his fellow citizens. 
The book of the epoch shows that at least in 10th century Constantinople, the margins of just profit were regulated by the state through a protective legislation, which mainly took into consideration social and economic justice. The result, as Angeliki Laiu has summarized it, was that merchants could maximize their profit primarily by increasing the volume of their transactions, not by taking advantage of fluctuations in supply and demand. As for the price of the bread, it remained fixed, most likely because of accounting reasons and the numismatic stability, which lasted until the first quarter of the 11th century. Therefore, the inevitable fluctuations of the price of the wheat affected only the weight of the bread, not its price. That is the reason why paragraph 18.4 of the Book of the Epoch decrees that bakers, quote, as often as the price of wheat rises or falls, are to go to the Epoch in order that the weights of bread may be regulated for the sale by the Epoch's assessor, end quote. As it has already been mentioned, on the occasion of the baker's profit, the Book of the Epoch refers to baker's people. These were obviously the bakery's personnel that assisted in the preparation and baking of the bread. Once again, the 12th century Tohoprodromic poems offer some details concerning certain of the baker's assistants. There is a reference to the Zimotis, Nieder, and the Parazimotis, assistant Nieder, those who were making and handling the dough. Of course, bakeries could have housed less specialized personnel, apprentices, or slaves. It is noteworthy that in the early Byzantine period, when there existed enormous bread factories with great needs in labor force, work in these bakeries was used as a form of penal service for fugitive slaves. The living conditions in these places were very harsh. However, these bread factories had ceased to exist in Middle Byzantium. The profession of the baker was extremely useful, but hardly illustrious. In this sense, the notorious emperor Andronikos I Komnenos in the 12th century, who persecuted many aristocratic families, tried to quieten his sons who had been alarmed by his deeds by saying that, quote, he would leave none to survive him but butchers and bakers and ungund boilers and persons of that type, end quote. However, it was not improbable for some members of the wider profession to prosper. Especially in the 11th and 12th centuries, the so-called civil aristocracy engulfed families which had close ties with trade and industry. Sometimes a family's name implied a past linked with certain professions. That is the case with the Furnitarius or Furnitaris family, whose members are attested to hold civil offices between the late 12th and early 13th century. This family's name means baker. According to Fedon Kukules, a Furnitaris baked food and pastries and he is to be distinguished from the Mangips, who made and baked bread. Thus, on the eve of the Fourth Crusade, certain Byzantine bakers managed not only to perform their duty, providing their fellow citizens with the most basic foodstuff, but also to climb the social ladder. In sum, bakers in Byzantium and later milled grain, baked bread and sold it. In some cases, a professional baker performed all of these tasks, while in other cases, there was a distinct division of labor. At any rate, as the special treatment of the Constantinopolitan Guild of Bakers concerning corvées shows, they were to be consid considered as a sine qua non in the sustenance of an urban population. The diffusion of bakeries all over Constantinople would have been a suggestive reminder of the vital role they played in the everyday life of the capital. Thank you very much.
Grasme, thank you very much for your contribution. Questions and intervention will be followed after the speech of Mariana Gerasimou. Mariana Gerasimou will talk on the varieties of bread in the Ottoman period. Mariana Gerasimou is a very well-known historian of the Ottoman cuisine with many books and on uh, this subject uh, and the cuisine of Sarai. And of course, the last book, uh, you know it, uh, concerns the cuisine and all the, the kind of foods uh, in Evliyatche Lebi. Mariana. Welcome, everyone. And I would like to thank Ms. Evangelia. So, I will take the floor from where Gerasimus left. I will try to describe you what happened after 1453. And I have learned new things from him, and I will try to describe you. During the period of Ottoman Empire, just like the Roman period or the Byzantine period, one of the most important duties of the managers was to meet the bread need of the Istanbul population because there was this lack of lack of bread and they knew that lack of bread would trigger societal events and incidents and for that reason they would always try to keep the quality of bread, the weight of bread, the number of meals and number of bakeries and the price of the bread under control. And they would always inspect the production process of bread. In addition to these inspections and controls, by the end of the 19th century, they would always uh, provide a majority of Istanbul population with free bread every day. So the precautions were taken by the Ottoman administration so that the Istanbul people would always have a bread on their table. And they, there were rules with respect to which oven which baker would provis, uh, produce what type of bread would be produced. And as a result, there was a fixed standard with respect to bread production. And uh, the bakeries in Istanbul could not produce any other quality of bread. As a result of these standards, for centuries, four main types of bread were produced in Istanbul bakeries. However, bread culture of the Ottomans were not limited to these four types because the inspection was very tight in the capital, but in a wide geography of Ottoman Empire, there were many other bakeries in other parts of the empire, and there were unlimited numbers of bread produced. How do we know them? First of all, there are official records kept in the archives, and these official documents also there are some informal sources like the travel books and when we mix the information gained from two sources we can understand that there are almost 40 types of breads this is a metaphorical number uh, we cannot say there are there were necessarily 40 types of breads uh, but uh, there were so many different types of bread. So I will try to describe them as much as I can. So four standard types of bread were produced in Istanbul according to type of the wheat or the flour. First of all, uh, there was this Has bread, Artos Katarosos in Byzantium. So Has Ekmek was made of Hasu Allah 
wheat bread. It was soft and delicious and tasteful. It would be cooked in the bakery of the palace and even in Haas uh, bakery of the palace. It was premium quality and it would only be served to the Sultan and the family of the Sultan. Also it would be distributed to the seniors of the palace. It would be served to the guests in the festivals organized by the palace and it would also be sent to the important people out of the palace as a gift. It would be cooked in the Hass bakery of the palace and it would not be sold. The second bread is Fodola. It is medium quality wheat flour. It is flat and it had a soft crust. Fodula actually means a small pita in Greek and it was derived from the word pitula. There were two types of fotula. The better quality fotula was white fotula and there was this brown fotula or black fotula which was made of bran mixed with wheat flour and there were consumers of fotula. The fodula cooked in fodula bakery of the palace would be distributed to the staff of the palace starting from uh, Valide Sultan, the mother of the Sultan. And the fodula produced in the bakery of the Janissary would be delivered to the Janissaries for free. Also, uh, there were some workhouses. These workhouses would also produce fodula and they would distribute bread to the students studying in the mattresses, to the poor and to the travelers. Actually, it was not a high quality bread, but it would be considered as a concession if you gain an access to fodula. The third bread is Harji Hariji, Harji bread, Misukatharo in the Byzantium period. The, it would be made of mixed flowers, bran and wheat flour. It was a hard one to eat and it was a third class bread. Uh, for centuries Istanbul people ate this bread. Officially it is known as Hajri bread and it was also named Somun loaf bread. And Somun actually is derived from Psomos in Greek. My colleague has also mentioned Podula comes from Pita and Somun comes from the word psomos in Greek. Also, according to the type of the flower used, it would be either soft or more whitish uh, or more hard but it would usually be brown color. As I said before, the state would fix the rules with respect to weight of the bread and price of the bread and not any officer would set these rules. The Sadrazam would set the rules. He would order the weight of the bread and the price of the bread and even sometimes the Padishah would intervene this. That what, for example, he would say uh, the bread was not so uh, expensive in the past, but now it is expensive. If there is a lack of bread, so if the bread is lighter than the weight it should be, or if it is sold for a price higher than fixed, uh, the bakeries would be punished and it would differ according to the quality, according to the nature of uh, the blame. First of all, they would be beaten. Secondly, they would be displayed in the streets saying this guy produces a low quality bread either 
uh, they would be exempted from profession or if there are those who do it very badly they would be captured in prisons and or they would be even executed and I would like to share an interesting thing with you which I came across in a document among the bakers there were many non-Muslim people in order to punish the Christian bakers they would send them to sea and they would send the Muslim bakers to prison to punish Harji bread was sold for the same period for a very long time during the empire only one akche so how did it happen because the price of wheat would increase in case of wars and other natural disasters in that in that case the weight of the bread would be lowered in 15th century the bread would weigh around 500 grams and there were even periods when it was reduced to 100 or 200 grams so they would pay attention so that they will not increase the price of the bread and the fourth type of bread franjala the bread franjala would be produced in the bakeries with a special license in Galata and it would only be sold to the embassies and it would be called Franceli back in those times. The Ottoman administration gave uh, the concession of baking bread for the first time to the French embassy in 16th century therefore the name of the bread was called Franceli later on this concession was given to the other embassies and to the uh, bakeries in Galata but the name did not change and the Franceli did not change a lot since those time and it became Francala in Franciala in our time so it would only be sold to the embassy so obviously the foreigners living in Ottoman would eat Franceli so who would bake them the foreigners maybe there were some foreigners especially in the first times during 16th century there were some French bakers but you will not guess who the Jews no not the Jews Franchella bakers of a Ottoman were the Catholic Kios people. Uh, most probably they, they got this concession in 16th century and they kept it in their monopoly until 16th century. The Rum people from Kios produced this Franceli because Kios was the Ottoman lands until 19th century so from Athens to Bucharest they are still producing and selling Franciala uh, during Tanzimat period it was not brought to Ottoman period Ottoman area it was an Istanbul bread with a history of 400 years and I'll say most probably because we do not have any visuals the shape of Franciala I think was similar to today's Franciala actually we have some visuals with respect to bread but mostly it is about husk bread consumed in the palace these triangles that you see are pieces of husk bread actually husk bread is a circular one and it would be uh, broken into four pieces and it would be served as triangles so we have seen house bread in the palace it would be 
cut into four pieces. So what else were the types of bread? You are seeing naan. Naan means bread in Persian and it is always called naan in the official documents. You cannot see any word of ekmek or bread in the official documents. Only the people would say ekmek. Naan has. This document is dated 1675 and this belongs to the period of Mehmet IV. And on the left hand side, we see the number of breads given to the Padishah, to the Sultan. On the right hand side, we see the number of breads given to Haseki Sultan, the wife of the Sultan. Everyone would get bread according to their rank. So according to this rule, we see the number and type of the bread taken by a person is fixed. We are seeing a double and a dead. Double is most probably was given uh, because they were small. None has, we have said, has bread. None pitch, none nohut. It included chickpea inside it. Even the lowest quality bread in Ottoman was wheat and chickpea was used as a yeast. None pita is pita. None girde is also another type of pita. And none sukeri was a sugar bread. We still don't know what Nan Mirahuri is and Nan Imam is. Actually, my colleague has mentioned all of the breads because the Byzantine people, the Byzantine historians, historians have been dealing with this issue for a long time, but we're not into that so yet. And we see Nan Has was given only two pairs and Nan Pitch one pair. Nan Pita one pair, Nan Nohut one pair, and Nan Mirahuri two pieces. These are actually very big numbers. Uh, was the Sultan consuming 24 breads? No, that was uh, the number of breads he was entitled to receive, and most probably the breads would be distributed. This is the document from the palace. Also, we know that uh, there are breads baked in the palace which are not listed here. For example, Mehmet the conqueror would consume bread with fennel and animal fat. Also, there were some uh, types of breads in the Ottoman world. I could not list 40 of them, please. Suffice with this one, I think you will be filled. First of all, bread with any seed. It would be produced in Manisa. Actually, we owe this list to Evliya Celebi. We understand that there were different types of luxurious breads produced in the palace, but in the Anatolia there were some different types of bread produced in Anatolia. And thanks to Evliya Celebi we can understand that there was this food culture apart from Istanbul. Somon loaf with any seed. Also, chakal bread produced in Amasya, Diyarbakir, Bitlis, Bursa, and Egypt. So, what was chakal bread? The gravels would be. The gravels would be uh, heated in fire, then the gravels would be coated with dough, and the gravels would cook the bread. Also, durme bread. This is also another type of bread produced in Alanya. Also, loaf with clove and cinnamon. 
in Erdel. Erdel was also a part of the Ottoman Empire. Lawash, we also know that it means thin bread. It says here, but actually we can come across this one in all parts of Anatolia. Mekik bread, it was because of this shape in also mimetic bread, it was round. Pishi, we also know that very well, uh, and it is produced in Antalya, Antakya. Ramad Ramadan pita, there were different types of Ramadan pita uh, produced in Istanbul. Sapanjalov, also bread with sesame, tandish bread, tophane loaf, it was a very white bread, which was always fresh, and he descri describes this one in length, and you've covered it. So all of these breads would be cooked in Anatolia, and all of them were made with the wheat flour. There are only four types of breads that do not include wheat flour. One of them is kasul. Seed bread. It is actually a spinoza, and it's a type of grass, and the grass would be dried, then milled, and they would eat. So, dar, dar bread. Dar, uh, dar means millet, millet bread, and the Tatar would always eat them. Farfara is bran. Heldine from Bosnia. It is actually a type of bean and they would cook bread with the seeds of them. And another interesting thing in Mora, in Greece, Kalimbok bread, which means maize bread. According to my research, I understand that Kalimbok was planted in 18th century in Greece, but Evria says he saw uh, maize bread in 17th century in Mora. There they were the types of breads in the Anatolia. Also, Istanbul had some types of Ramadan pita. Has and white Ramadan pita. Uh, Ramadan pita with almond, Ramadan pita with caraway seed, and Ramadan, Ramadan pita with almond and poppy, Ramadan pita with saffron. They would be produced in uh, the bakeries which obtain a special type of permit to produce bread during the Ramadan. This is the representation of an Ottoman producing pita. And this is the circumcision festival uh, of a sultan son, and we see a bakery producing pita for the festival. This is a pita bread. I would like to underline this because in Ottoman. Each and every type of bakery had a different permit to produce bread. So there were many types of bakeries. And Gerasimos said the same thing for Byzantium. There were some bakeries for cooking bread and for cooking other types of cookies, for example. The same thing happens in today. The Bagel bakery is different from a bread bakery or pocha bakery was different. For example, in Karaköy, a pocha bakery, no bread was made. So in 17th century, there were Fodula bakeries, Frankala bakeries, Chakul bread bakeries, pastry and bun bakeries, fritter and pancake bakeries, crisp bakeries, kirde bakeries, biscuit bakeries and bagels bakeries. So they had different types of permits to produce 
bread and they would only act in accordance with their permit. So if a Fodula bakery obtained a permit uh, for Fodula, they cannot produce any other type of bread. So they would also provide the bakeries with special type of permits for a period of three months, for example, in times of need. And other than that, each bakery would only produce the product they were entitled to. And in other cases, uh, they, would, they would be prosecuted. And if they do something that is prohibited, they would either be exempted from profession or they would be nailed in the bakery from their ears. The reason is, for example, the license uh, allows them to produce only a bagel. And if, as a bagel bakery, you produce loaf, you go outside your area of specialization and you cause a loss of profit for the other baker, baker and you violate the rules. And for that reason, they nail you from your ears on the wall of the bakery. There are also some gravers, there are also some representations, but I don't want to show it because you will feel upset. And also, bagels. Bagel was something like this in 18th century. So these were the bagel sellers in 18th century. This, as I said, uh, every bakery had an area of specialization. So, and these are the numbers of bakeries in 17th century and 18th century. This is not a statistical number, only some compilations from different types of sources. On the left-hand side, uh, there, there are information from Mantran, and on the right-hand side, there are information from Kamil Kepeche. In Surici, in old Istanbul, there were 84 uh, bakeries, 11 in Ape, 14 in Iskidar, 25 in Galata, and in total it was 133. In second part of 18th century, the population of Istanbul was 500,000, and the, the number of bakeries was not so high, but uh, they would cook such bread and tandır bread at homes. They were not bakeries, but they would still produce some bread at home. I cannot say anything for the population in the 17th centuries. Uh, actually, it is obvious that the population increased and the number of bakeries also increased. This is only num the bakeries for bread, not the other bakeries. So the bread is cooked or baked in the bakery and the bakeries also sell, but actually the breads would be sold outside the bakeries. There were two types of sales points. One of them was a fixed sales points, for example, the groceries or tables or some charities. And there were also mobile sellers. They would wander the area under their responsibility and they would sell bread. But both the fixed sellers and the mobile sellers were uh, bound to one bakery. They would make an agreement with a bakery and they would only sell the bread from that bakery. And the mobile seller could not go outside the area they were responsible, so there was no free competition back then. A mobile seller in 17th century, this was an Armenian guy, because among the tradesmen of bakeries there were many non-Muslim people, and they were Armenian people and the Greek people. 
Most of them were Armenians, and according to some sources of the 19th century, it is called Armenian love. Greeks, part of them from Chios, and there were also Greeks of Istanbul or Greeks from Anatolia. There was uh, no Anatolian baker. Most of them were, were Trakia bakers, and half of them would produce frangela, and the other half would produce bread. And also in bread industry, there were many Albanians, both Christian and Muslim. And they would produce not only bread, but also other types of things like bagel or crisp. Uh, yes, we said the Armenians, and they would produce loaf, and the Armenian sellers under some bakeries would wander the streets and they would sell the breads. In 18th century, they started selling the breads on tables, and they were called tablaja. This is a Muslim tablaja, and it is also written on the picture. The sellers were very vast. There was a very huge number of them. They would only sell bread. Yes, like the bagel sellers today. They would go out every morning and they would sell wandering the street, streets and at the end of the month they would have an offsetting with the bakery so the accounting would be made at the end of the month and as a result in Istanbul the patients or the elderly would be able to get their fresh bread and even they would wander during morning time and evening time because the Istanbul people would love fresh and hot bread. So they would serve twice a day and thanks to them the Istanbul people and those who cannot go out of their homes would not be deprived of bread. And as Evliya said, Allah, God, should never leave a city without food, bread, and water, because our ancestors said bread is the staff of life. Well, thank you for your attention. Diana Gerasimu, thank you very much for your contribution You're welcome. for this important and very interesting yeah, history of the Ottoman bread. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we have uh, yeah, the, some uh, half an hour for question and intervention. Please. Evet, yeah, buyur. Bana mı? Eee, Nasıl istiyorsunuz? Türkçe. Tamam, tamam. Buyur. Hocam, uh, ordu uzun seferlere gittiği zaman So when the army went for the battles would they take any biscuit or bread with them or they would have a mobile bakery? Of course they would take biscuit with them, but the bakers, bakers would also participate in the army, especially the Albanian bakers and the bakers, the gen, uh, Yeniser, Yeniser, Yeniseris, would go to the battles in army, so the army would have many cooks and bakeries with them. They would establish their own bakeries. So they were professional 
bakers and most of them were Albanian. Well, you spoke of four main types of bread. In Byzantine period and in the, on the Ottoman period, uh, we see that the bread with bran is called as a poor quality bread, but it is a rich quality bread today. So do you think it was hard be while being cooked, or was it because of uh, the fact of nutrition? So they didn't think it was nutritional, actually. And in 19th century, in 1860, the physicians actually said the bread with bran is very harmful. First of all, it is brown, it is hard, and white bread is frangela. Still, the people love white bread. So uh, the bran bread is very new. It is only 10 years, maybe, uh, the white bread is called harmful and the brown bread is said to be healthy so it was not proper back then you also said they would distribute bread to the poor between uh, which period in which period and how many people would obtain well with respect to emirates we can't know how many people would get bread, but you can understand how many charities would distribute. You can look at the tax of Emir Bakan. Also, you said uh, the Sultan would intervene. So, the reason was the fact that the bread was a very basic material and it would change the conditions of the whole economy. You said the price of the bread was fixed by the rules, so the reason is that it could be a reason of rebellion, and as you know, uh, the French Revolution started with that. They did not want to have any conditions to trigger any rebellions. Thank you very much. Uh, the free bread, uh, the distribution of free bread is limited in the early Byzantine period. After this, after the loss of uh, uh, Egypt by the Arab occupation, there is no free bread. Therefore, um, the only distribution in Middle Byzantine period has to do, no, excuse me. Uh, the only di uh, distribution of free bread in uh, Middle Byzantine period has to do with uh, the distribution to the poor. Uh, by these uh, institutions, these philanthropical uh, institutions, such as uh, hospitals uh, which were attached to near monasteries or great churches. Um, is it, do you want me to? In the early Byzantine period. First of all, I would like to thank you for all the, all the information you gave us. But there is this question in my mind. You said the Albanians and the non-Muslim people would produce, and you did not say anything with respect to Belexi region. And uh, all of the bakeries in Istanbul are now oper operated by the Belexi region people. So, Trabzon bread. I'm so sorry that I did not mention that. Thank you. First of all, 
it's a huge success to initiate the cycles of lectures as so we would like to thank Evangelia because this is an important issue in terms of the food between two cultures and it is a great success to initiate this cycle of lectures secondly as far as you mentioned, there was this control of state with respect to production and sales of bread. And also, uh, there is a support from the private industry because you said the biscuit bakers and the other bakers would be operated freely after they receive a license from uh, the state. So I was wondering if the practices during the Byzantium period was the same. So maybe it would be done under the control of the state and they would be inspected by the certain mills and only some certain type of people would get a license. So what do you think about that? Yes, there is a similarity and my colleague is more knowledgeable about it, but there is a huge similarity. As you know, many institutions were transferred from Byzantium to the Ottoman, either in a good or bad manner, but my colleague would say more in this respect. Could you please repeat the question? Of course, of course there was, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, of course, there was uh, a state intervention, even in the field of prices, uh, because, uh, you know, after the Macedonian uh, dynasty, uh, there was a great struggle to keep uh, prices fixed. That's why I mentioned uh, the just price and uh, uh, just value notions, uh, in order the merchants and the professionals not to take advantage of their fellow citizens. Uh, that was uh, from the 10th to the 12th century at least, and uh, after the Latin occupation of the of the Constantinople, this uh, continue. Uh, to be into this continued to be a major concern of the state. I'm sorry, we cannot find such environments very often, so I have a second question for you. For years, we have received some historical sources, either the Ottoman sources or the national sources, and the public sources. And I was wondering in detail if I want to research it in detail. You said that there were declarations from governor or sadrazam and were the rules valid in other parts of Ottoman as well? In the major cities they were valid. For example, the decisions made for Istanbul bread would apply to Edirne or Bursa and even in Balakesar, which is respect, uh, relatively smaller, the weight, the sales price, they would be similar to each other. But Ottoman Empire had a very wide geography and the control would get weaker and weaker as you go outside the center. It was actually nice because they were able to produce other types of bread. There were four types of breads in Istanbul, in addition to Ramadan pita. But according to the information from Evlia, the Anatolia land was much more rich in terms of other types of breads. And it, the reason was that it was not controlled. It was actually not possible to run the whole empire with only four breads. Who could possibly access to Bitlis or one? And there was an administrator in 
one and uh, he would set his own rules and it was actually nice because we had a type, uh, we had a differentiation. Also according to economy letters there were many other sources. If you go to the archives to have a research with respect to bread, it would take four or five years of yours but we still don't have any research. There are many sources. There was this implementation in other provinces for Bursa, Antep, Edirne in 18th and 19th century. The weight and price of sales was determined in addition to Istanbul, yes, Edirne and Bursa. I am Özge Samancı and I'm working on recipes, so I would like to thank you for this organization. This is Musa Dağ Deviren. I would like to make a contribution. This punishing is still valid in Anatolia, for example. If the baker makes a smaller bread, the chamber of bakers first inspect and the municipality inspect. They do not weigh it cold, they weigh it warm because it would be less when it is cold. And such things still are valid at the first attempt. They close it down for one day, and after third warning, they can even be shut down. For example, if there are two bakeries in the same neighborhood, you will open it on one Sunday, and I will open it on the next Sunday. So it is still valid. But they are not nailing you in the uh, wall from your ears, right? Yes, that was the case in pa in the past. That's still the same in Anatolia. Yes, you can find that many things still continue in Anatolia because it's a tradition. Thank you for the presentation. Is there any milestone uh, for Franjala to reach uh, the ordinary people? We are not eating has bread today. Has bread was also white. It was a great uh, wheat from Bursa, but Franjala was also white, and it was also has bread. And Franjala would only be consumed by a certain part. Has ekmek, has bread would be consumed by the palace, and Franjala would be consumed by the embassies, and the bakeries would only sell to the embassies. Also, in the first period of the Republic, I understand that there was a policy over bread, and I understand that there, there was this classification, class differences over bread. So, what changed with the Republic? This will not change with the policy. This is a tradition and it takes time to change the traditions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your for coming there. And I hope to see you the next uh, month in our conference on wine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>